My name is Patrick Newman. Uh, I, I might have met some of you yesterday. You, you should have seen me. I was wearing a polo and shorts looking like I was a caddy. Uh, so hopefully I've dressed up a little bit. Uh, I swear that's not my profession, though the way higher education is going, that might be what I'm going to end up doing over the next 10 years, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> so the title of my talk is The Jacksonian's Bank War, Liberty versus Power. So I wanted to talk, given this is a Mises Institute event, I wanted to talk about cronyism. So those policies that don't benefit the public at large, but benefit various special interests, things like licenses, central banking, taxes, tariffs, subsidies, et cetera, right, that we know are economically inefficient and harmful. And given that we're at Jekyll Island, I wanted to talk about monetary cronyism, because this is the famous site where in November 1910, a bunch of elite New York City bankers sort of schemed to devise the Federal Reserve System that... Uh, all of us in this room are so grateful that we're, we're living under, you know. Um, and how I, you know, given that it's been a rough year uh, for all of us, we've had to deal with a lot, we've all had to wear a lot, uh, I wanted to try and talk about, uh, and be on an optimistic note, and talk about a reform against monetary cronyism, particularly Andrew Jackson's fight against the Second Bank of the United States, which uh, climaxed in his triumphant sort of veto against the recharter. So this is from my book, my forthcoming book titled Liberty Versus Power, Cronyism in the United States, 1607 to 1849. At least that's the tentative title. Uh, the Mises Institute will be publishing it next year. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, it was uh, completed with a generous research grant by Hunter Lewis. And I continue the story of Murray Rothbard in Conceived in Liberty. Because Rothbard, his, his central thesis was that history is a climactic, eternal battle between liberty and power. The forces of liberty, so those libertarians who are fighting for greater individualism, decentralization, free markets, anti-cronyism, and the forces of power. So the statists that support gov greater government central planning, greater coercion, and cronyism to benefit themselves in other political and business elites. So the history of the United States particularly the early history of the United States, should be understood as a great battle between liberty and power, right? So when power wins, when they take control of the government, cronyism increases, central banking increases, protective tariffs increases, taxes increases, subsidies increases, debt increases, et cetera, et cetera, right? And when the forces of liberty take control, cronyism declines, right? Uh, we move to free trade, we move to decentralized money, the gold standard, uh, we move to paying off the debt, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, and this is something that Rothbard speaks about at Conceived in Liberty, and this is something that I discuss in my book, is that when forces of liberty win, they're able to get some reforms done, but power starts to corrupt. The old phrase of Lord Acton, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, holds true where eventually the people in control, they start to support their own uh, versions of, of central planning and government intervention to benefit themselves and their favorite supporters. They want to win re-election. They want to expand their political base. We've seen this in our lifetimes, and this certainly happened in the past when you certainly had uh, a much more libertarian uh, political parties, particularly the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Jacksonian Democrats, right, who were legitimately concerned about cronyism and they were legitimately limited government and anti-government intervention. They got a lot of uh, hate now, given that we're in the world of politically correct culture and the cancel culture and people have, have, have sort of demonized uh, these figures ripping down statues, particularly of Andrew Jackson. They certainly had their flaws, but I think they have a lot of good stuff about them that no one learns about, you know, at least in, in modern high school or college and et cetera, right? And what I want to concentrate on is the Jacksonians, who I think get criticized far too much uh, and really deserve uh, a much better place in history. Because the Jacksonians, Andrew Jackson included, as well as his prominent political advisors, Martin Van Buren, Thomas Hart Benton, James K. Polk, Amos Kendall, right, all the names we all know, right? Uh, most of them, probably not. Um, they, were, they, were, they were libertarians. They were free market. They were anti-government intervention. They were anti-tariff. 
They were anti-debt. They were anti-central banking. All right. And it's important to understand this because what I want to try and show is that you know, they were able to get it done and with the tenacity and the persistence all right, and the, and the, the drive to, to whittle down the state and to, 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 to fight for what you believe in, they, got, they, they managed to accomplish most of their goals before power ended up corrupting them. So that's at least sort of a, a somewhat optimistic note I want us to all uh, hopefully leave this talk uh, thinking about. Okay. So my story begins with central banking in the United States, or even just banking in general. A lot of people, if you read uh, histories uh, such as Roger Lowenstein's America's Bank, this history on the Federal Reserve, it's footnoted in the, the little handout they give at Jekyll Island, and they would say, oh, banking before the Federal Reserve was chaotic, and this is due to the free market. Right? In reality, that's not true. Uh, banking problems were well, for, banking problems were generally uh, exaggerated, and what problems existed were not due to the free market because there was a significant amount of government intervention. If you wanted to operate a bank, you had to have a corporate charter, a restrictive license. Basically, you had to get from the state legislature. Right? Banks were periodically allowed to suspend specie payments, the convertibility of their notes and deposits in the gold. Governments, state governments, invested a significant amount in their banks, right? And so what happened on the state level basically happened on the federal level. This cronyism was magnified. So we all know the story of the first bank of the United States with you've got Alexander Hamilton pushing for it in 1791. Jefferson puts up a valiant stand, but it's not enough. Washington ends up signing the bank bill. This is something I talk about in my book uh, because he was allowed to move, choose the, the location of Washington, D.C. And he wanted to put it a little near all of his property in Northern Virginia. So it's actually a true story as to why he sort of signed, ended up signing the bank bill. Uh, but anyway, I can't tell too much about that now or else you're not going to read the book. So I got to keep everyone, you know, hopefully a little interested, right? That bank uh, has a 20-year charter. It lasts until 1811. All right, charter uh, fails to get renewed. You get the War of 1812, blah, 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 blah. Right? we fight Great Britain. We try and take over Canada and Florida. We're not super successful. Right. In 1816, uh, Congress charters another central bank, right? the second bank of the United States, as it's now known. This was at the behest of leading financiers, John Jacob Astor and Stephen Girard, who bought a tremendous amount of government debt during the war at highly depreciated rates. And they pushed to have bank stock exchangeable for government debt. So this would push up the price of their debt and increase the rate of return they earned on their investments. And this bank was like the first bank of the United States, only bigger. It had, instead of a $20 million capitalization, it had a $35 million capitalization. The government, Congress owned one fifth of the bank. It appointed one fifth of the directors. It had a monopoly over interstate banking. So it was the only bank Congress would charter that could operate branches across state lines. And it was also the institution where the government stored all of its money. So this was a huge subsidy. All right. So this was just like the first bank of the United States. It was an engine. John Randolph of Roanoke, a great uh, theorist who, who's totally neglected now, put up a valiant stand in Congress, but the bank got chartered. All right? And it opened its doors in 1817. And what does it do? Well, again, we're all Austrian economists and fellow travelers here, so we know it's going to inflate. It's going to engage in credit expansion. And this led to an Austrian business cycle theory, artificially lowering interest rates, encouraging malinvestments. This culminated in a panic of 1819. However, what's also not known is that this institution, right at its inception, was an enormously corrupt institution. I cannot stress this enough. Where the government officials running the, running the bank, particularly at the Baltimore branch, the main branches in Philadelphia, they were basically engaging in an enormous amount of illegal activities. So various government uh, officials, uh, including one cashier named James McCulloch, uh, he was, they were lending themselves money to speculate in stock that they falsely claimed to secure with collateral, and they falsely claimed to have gotten the uh, main board's approval in various other activities, bribing uh, local government officials and politicians. The, the bank was depicted as this giant hydra 
its, it's, it's various heads and its tentacles were sort of you know, corrupting everything uh, with, it, with its credit expansion, right? And I actually think that's a really good depiction of a central bank. It's a hydra. I think, it, you know, it, it, it's a great. Uh, if you could have that in a modern money and banking textbook, you open up the first page and you see a giant hydra, and then you say, all right, this is central banking. I'd say, all right, well, so far, you know, I would think about assigning this uh, to my students. But so the bank was engaged in an enormous amount of corruption, in mid-1818, Congress starts to investigate the bank. Uh, the bank also starts to contract credit because it's starting to lose specie from abroad. This leads to the Panic of 1819 in uh, the early part of the year, right? Which, bear in mind, was by far the most significant event uh, in that year. It was not the Missouri crisis over slavery. It was the Panic of 1819. That's what the public cared about. And they were really upset because they thought that the central bank correctly caused this, engaged in a huge boom, and then led to a bust, right? And the Panic of 1819, as Murray Rothbard describes, led to a huge resurgence in hard money laissez-faire thought. So men who were starting their political careers, Andrew Jackson, James K. Polk of Tennessee, Amos Kendall of Kentucky, Martin Van Buren of New York, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. They started their political careers scarred by this, uh, this panic, and they wanted to reform the system because they said there's something that's terribly wrong with this central bank. We got to get rid of it, or we got to do something against it. Now, in the early 1820s, the bank had a lot of friends, okay? It had paid off various newspapers in return for favorable loans, most notably the National Intelligencer in Washington, D.C., so it would espouse various pro-central banking uh, articles in return, get some nice cushy loans from the bank. Okay? I, it's, this might be something new to you guys, but the media is often in connection with the government. I don't know this. Again, uh, we all learn something new here, right? No, but this was continuing uh, for many years. The bank had employed various high-profile politicians who owned stock and who performed legal work for the bank. Henry Clay of Kentucky, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, even John Quincy Adams, who was the president from 1825 to 1829, owned stock in the bank. Okay? So it had friends in high places. The bank also uh, had the young Hamiltonian Nicholas Biddle, the arrogant central banker who started working for the bank in 1819, became its president in 1823, who wanted to nationalize the monetary system. Okay? And most importantly, <laughs> it had... The legal defense had had Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall, who defended the bank in McCulloch versus Maryland in early 1819. Uh, uh, Marshall said that the bank could not be taxed. Various states, particularly Maryland, tried to tax the bank like they taxed their other banks. McCulloch said no. Uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, Marshall said no. Uh, you can't do that. And also, by the way, the Constitution, the federal government can pretty much do whatever it wants. All right. And something that's not known, again, you want an instance of cronyism, is John Marshall owned stock in the bank. And he sold his shares right before the court case. But again, things that make you go, hmm, all right, you know, what's, what's going on here, right? Well, the bank had a lot of friends in high places, just like the Federal Reserve, right? However, Martin Van Buren, after the corrupt election of 1824, when John Quincy Adams was able to deprive uh, and, uh, Andrew Jackson of his victory, basically created the Democratic Party, this new libertarian organization. It's the same Democratic Party of today. Some slight differences, as, you can, as I'm sure you can imagine. And Andrew Jackson uh, defeats uh, John Quincy Adams, and what does he start doing in 1829? Well, he starts attacking the bank. Because Andrew Jackson had his flaws, but he was generally against, anti, uh, he was generally against central banking. He was well-learned in various free market economics, and he didn't know exactly what to replace the bank with. He eventually settled on the independent treasury, at least his supporters, separating the federal government entirely from banking. But he started off attacking the bank in his uh, 1829 inaugural message to Congress. And so what does Biddle do? Well, he bribes everyone. Okay? He, up till about 1832, he lends $100,000 to newspapers to write pro-central banking periodicals. He spends fifty dollars to $100,000 of the central bank's own money uh, publishing pro or sponsoring pro-central banking periodicals in various economic outlets, such as the American Quarterly Review. And he loans $100,000 to $200,000 of money to various congressmen to vote for the bank. Okay. This is the hydra. It's the, it's the tentacles. Okay, they're coming to get everyone. 
and the various Hydra heads. But, you know, you don't do that against Andrew Jackson. You don't do that against Old Hickory, right? He's the ba he won the Battle of New Orleans, uh, and he wasn't going to have people try and push him around. Because Andrew Jackson and his supporters, they keep fighting, right? They keep trying to say, no, you know what? We're going to get rid of the bank. And when Biddle, in early 1832, he pushes for an early recharter at the behest of Henry Clay, who was running for the presidential election in 1832. He wanted to weaken Andrew Jackson. His vice president, vice presidential candidate, was a former lawyer for the bank. Okay? This is clearly a great battle of liberty versus power, a triumphant sort of uh, a clash that was coming up. Right? And through June 1832, Biddle is able to steer the, the bank, the recharter bill, the early recharter bill through Congress, right? And he actually, when the bill is chartered, he appears before Congress triumphant, and he holds a big party for his supporters afterwards. And you think Jackson is going to meekly uh, sign the bill and then lose re-election in 1832, later in the year. But Jackson doesn't do that. He vetoes the bill, right? He says, the veto is without a doubt the greatest presidential document against cronyism in American history, period. Because Jackson said the bank is corrupt, it has various privileges, and it's benefiting the politically connected rich at the expense of the public at large, right? And when something like this happens, you've got to stop this institution, all right? So Jackson vetoed the bank. And guess what? Even though the swamp, the great DC establishment of the Whigs, uh, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster and et cetera, they tried to stop Andrew Jackson from winning. He triumphantly won re-election, okay? So the people supported him at this. And then uh, in 1833, he removes the deposits from the bank. The charter winds down in 1836. And then his successor, Martin Van Buren, institutes the independent treasury in 1840, all right? And what it shows is that, again, <laughs> The, 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 the libertarian victories don't come often a lot in politics. But if you fight for what you, what you believe in, and if you have the right political strategy, particularly the presidential veto in the Jacksonians case, and you've got the right muscle and the right tenacity, you can actually reform the system. And Andrew Jackson and the Jacksonians, they were able to do that. They were able to reform the system. And even though it only lasted for a little bit, even though we only had it, we didn't have a central bank, uh, or any sort of federal government involvement in the, econ in the monetary system until the Civil War, all right? And we eventually got the Federal Reserve System again, all right? We got to take pride in our victories, all right? And, and, and hold them high, all right? Because, it, again, the, 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 the history is a battle between liberty versus power, and you always have to be rooting for the forces of liberty. Because when you are able to align the forces of liberty, you are able to deal uh, significant blows to cronyism, such as monetary cronyism, or the central bank, okay? And with this, I think I'll end here. So thank you very much.